Hi everybody, welcome back. This is going to be a quick lesson on the topic of developing latent prints. So as you've become aware by now, if we uh, touch an object, such as this glass right here, we leave a residue of uh, sweat and possibly oils on the object. However, most of the time when we touch an object, we don't leave any visible fingerprint behind. Uh, still, those residues are there, and with the proper techniques, we can turn them into visible fingerprints that we can use in a criminal investigation. So let's take a look at how to do that. And so the question today is, how do we make invisible prints visible? So here are some development methods that we can use. Uh, and development in this context means making visible. So when we talk about developing latent prints, we mean uh, making them visible. Uh, so again, for context, whenever ridged skin touches a surface, sweat or oils are deposited on that surface, and these residues may persist for years. All the development methods that we're going to look at work by using different substances to stick to or react with these deposited fingerprint residues, making them visible. Uh, the methods for making prints visible, developing them, vary based on the material the print is on. So you don't use the same method no matter what. Uh, you choose the method based on the object that you suspect uh, the print is, is on. So for non-porous materials, these are things that would feel hard and smooth usually. Things like glass, leather, glazed ceramic, finished ceramic, something like uh, this mug right here, uh, lacquered wood, plastic. We have traditional fingerprint dusting, which you've probably seen before, a little brush, some powder on it, dust, 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 fingerprint appears. Uh, we also have cyanoacrylate fuming, which we might refer to more simply as superglue fuming, because the chemical we're using that's in the superglue is cyanoacrylate. Uh, for porous materials, things like paper, cardboard, unfinished wood, ceramic, cloth, uh, we'll have to use some diff different methods. So one might be iodine fuming, uh, another one would be ninhydrin treatment. And we'll talk, take a look at uh, all these different methods in a bit more detail uh, over the next few minutes. But super important to keep in mind that uh, we, we absolutely must photograph the developed print as soon as possible so that we don't lose it. Um, finding a fingerprint on a crime scene, that's great. Developing it so that it's visible, that's great too. But we need to record that information or it's worthless. So photographing is the easiest way to do this. Uh, if anything were to happen to the object, accidentally in handling it broke, or we failed to lift the fingerprint correctly, then we would at least have that photograph to fall back on. So let's take a look at these methods. Uh, the first one that we're going to look at for non-porous materials is dusting for prints. This is the classic. This is the old school method and it's still used today. So what we do is we take a very fine colored powder, we apply it with a brush. There are many colors that are available here. We have uh, the standard uh, white and black powder, but there are also different colored powders, like reds, greens, yellows, and so forth. The reason that there are so many different colors is because the objects that the prints are deposited on are different colors. So if I had, I don't know, these, these, uh, oh. So imagine that we had these headphones, which are made of black plastic, non-porous material, and uh, we suspected that there might be some fingerprints on here. We wanted to check for those. A black powder would be a really poor choice here because a black powder wouldn't show up on the black background. So we would want to use a white powder uh, to actually get a contrast that we could, we could see what's going on. Similarly, if we had uh, white plastic or something like that, then we would want to use uh, black powder and so forth. Uh, we also have many different types of brush. Some of these uh, preferences are just down to what the individual person prefers. Uh, we also have magnetic brushes. These are a lot of fun. You'll get to play with those shortly if you haven't already. Uh, so the way it works is you have this powder and it sticks to this fingerprint residue, the sweat or the oils that were deposited uh, by the finger. And since these powders are colored, now you can see uh, the fingerprint residues. Um, once the pattern appears, you can photograph it. If it's a small object, such as perhaps a mug, uh, then you can just transport the whole thing from the crime scene to your laboratory. But if it's a larger object, then you may need to lift the print by applying and removing uh, fingerprint lifting tape. So you basically just take a clear tape, stick it to the object, pull it off, and the dust comes with it, uh, preserving the form of the fingerprint. Good to photograph before you do this in case you mess it up. These prints that are now on the sticky tape can then be applied to a little card, the card labeled with all the information, where it was found and who did the lifting and when and all that sort of thing, uh, and then taken with you as evidence. 
So here are some images. Here is a police officer dusting for fingerprints on a glass uh, windshield, or um, uh, looks like a driver's side window. Uh, here is a magnetic brush being used to dust for fingerprint on what looks to be maybe a tile surface. Um, you can see actually the magnetic field lines on the magnetic brush. It's a, it's a neat tool. Um, and then here you can see actually some fluorescent fingerprint dusting powder has been used. And uh, on the left side is, so this is the, a picture of the same object. On the left side is the soda can where the fluorescent powder has been applied, but there's no uh, UV light shining on it. So if you look closely there, I think you can see the fingerprint ridge pattern on the can. Uh, and then on the right side, we've turned off the normal lights. We've turned on a, a uh, UV light to make the powder fluoresce. And you can see the really beautiful uh, pattern there. We use fluorescent powders often when the background is many different colors. Um, because there's no one powder that will stand out against all those colors. If we use a fluorescent powder, we can turn off the lights and then only the powder will glow. Also, it looks really neat. Uh, here's our fingerprint tape. You can see that a developed latent print has been lifted with that tape and then that would just be stuck to a card. So that's dusting for fingerprints. What else can we do? We also have cyanacrylate fuming. Uh, this is for non-porous materials as well. So in this case, the chemical cyanoacrylate is heated in a sealed environment with the object to be developed. So this could be a, a baggie or a Tupperware, or there are also, you know, in, in real criminal laboratories, there are little cabinets that they build. Um, and the idea of sealing it in is mostly just to keep a high concentration of these fumes in contact with the object. Side benefit, the cyanoacrylate is not really pleasant stuff and keeping it away from people is a positive. Uh, so what happens? So we heat this cyanoacrylate, these fumes gas off of this heated gel, and they stick to the residual oils or sweat of the fingerprint. And what we get is a white visible print. We can uh, further develop this print by adding uh, traditional colored powders. Um, they will stick to the cyanoacrylate. And a nice bonus of this is now we can lift the print, dust it, lift the print, dust it. Or in some cases, you can just lift it multiple times off of the object. Uh, which is really great. And sometimes you can actually clean up a print this way. Uh, we can also treat it with a fluorescent chemical and then view it under UV light. Either way, the cyanoacrylate fuming sort of fixes the print and keeps it from just disappearing uh, by being smudged or, or things like that and enables some further uh, treatment methods. And then as always, we wanna make sure to photograph it as soon as it's visible so that if we mess up down the line, we haven't destroyed this potentially valuable piece of evidence. Okay, so some images. Uh, here's an example of a, it looks like a plexiglass uh, box. We've got a Pringles can, uh, a revolver, and you can see in the back corner a cup, and that almost certainly contains the cyanoacrylate. Uh, that cup will be heated up, and the uh, fumes will come off and stick to the prints on these objects. We actually have some other methods as well. So today there are these basically wands. Think of it kind of like a hot glue gun. It's got a heating element right in the device and little cartridges of cyanoacrylate. And when you pull the trigger, the uh, cartridge heats, the, the heating element heats up the cartridge of cyanoacrylate and the fumes come out the other end. And so you can just point it exactly where you want to do the fuming. So it's a little more precise uh, and easy to use. And then the latents develop uh, as this uh, white appearing uh, substance that you can then stick some powder to or, or do with whatever you please. So that's cyanoacrylate fuming, another way to develop prints on a non-porous, hard, smooth material. Iodine fuming is the first of the methods we're looking at that will work on a porous material. So in this case, what we do is very similar to the cyanoacrylate fuming. We take the object, we put it in a closed container with solid iodine. This solid iodine will sublime at room temperature. You may recall from chemistry, sublimation is going from a solid state immediately to a gaseous state without passing through a liquid state. So it'll sublime from the solid into the gas, and then it'll deposit onto the fingerprint residue, and it'll form a sort of brownish colored visible print. Uh, again, the print should be photographed immediately. Uh, in this case, it's really important there's a, there's, a, there's a timer going because the iodine, once you take the bag off, will sublime back off of the print and into the air, and then you'll lose it. Um, we can stabilize these prints. There are chemical methods to stabilize them. We can also add starch uh, to stabilize the print, producing a purplish color. Uh, here are some images of iodine fuming. Here are some iodine crystals in ampules. Uh, these are produced by the company Searchy that does a lot of uh, forensic 
technology, some of the products we use in this class are, are by Sergi actually. Um, here's a basically a Tupperware filled with iodine crystals. You can see that as they fume, they form a brown residue, that's the iodine, and that'll deposit on the objects we're looking at. And here's the visualized print that results from the iodine. You can see that reddish brown color that's characteristic of iodine fuming. So that is iodine fuming, that is a uh, method we can apply to porous substances. For example, if there were a check or a piece of uh, uh, some money or something like that that you wanted to look at for fingerprints. Uh, the next one for porous substances is ninhydrin. This is the, uh, I think, the most commonly used method for porous latent print development at this time. So a ninhydrin solution, ninhydrin is a chemical. It comes as, <clears throat> it comes as a uh, white crystalline powder. Uh, you dissolve it in acetone or ethanol, some nonpolar solvent such as that. Um, you then either paint, soak, or spray the object you're interested in with an ninhydrin solution and then purple visible prints will appear um, maybe as early as one to two hours. Possibly uh, you will see some prints um, much later over the course of something like 48 hours. And what the ninhydrin is doing is it's reacting with trace amounts of amino acids that are present in the sweat. You may recall that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, proteins which do things in cells from uh, increasing the speed of chemical reactions, providing structure, signaling roles, you name it. So these amino acids are pretty ubiquitous, and ninhydrin will react with them and uh, produce a purple uh, product. We can accelerate this development by the application of heat, either doing this process in a warm box, or uh, as you'll see, there are some other ways to uh, increase the heat as well. Uh, and there are cases of ninhydrin treatment developing prints up to 15 years old on paper. Not too bad. So here's some images. Here's an anhydrin spray, a little spray bottle, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, one of the ways you can uh, accelerate this heating process is to use an iron. We would want this to be a dry iron, um, but just a way of, of applying heat to the problem. And there you have some anhydrin developed prints. They're a lovely purple color. So an anhydrin, that's another method in addition to iodine fuming that will allow us to develop latent prints on porous surf surfaces. So. We're, we're here at the end, let's review. Uh, invisible residues from contact with a surface when a finger touches it persist over time. They're still there even though you can't see them. Treating these residues with chemicals or powders will make them visible. Non-porous materials may be treated with traditional uh, dusting powder or cyanoacrylate fuming, AKA superglue fuming. Porous materials such as paper, for example, may be treated with iodine fuming or ninhydrin. And finally, prints should always be photographed as soon as possible to permanently collect that clue and preserve it against damage. So this was a look at some of the common methods for developing latent prints. I hope this was helpful. We'll see you soon.